You see the base on that one? That's a stone. I don't know about you guys, but this time of year I got some turkey calls laying on my desk, thinking about turkey season, but just a little bit, we're gonna talk about something really important that relates to turkey. You know, all wildlife and even humans. We're gonna visit with Dr. Lundgren. Dr. Lundgren's a big time scientist. He was named, you know, a top scientist in the USA a few years ago and has done some incredible work with a substance called neonix. Now, neonicotinoids are an insecticide put on the seed of a lot of corn and soybeans. I think like more than 95% of seed corn in America is treated with neonix and 50% of soybeans. And it's a good insecticide, but it has a lot of downsides, a lot. And unfortunately, some wildlife groups are promoting seeds treated with neonic. So I want Dr. Lundgren to tell us really what they're about, what's going on, and some of the harmful impacts. So we'll all be better advised whether we should use seed treated with neonics or not. Okay, folks, I'm talking with Dr. John Lundgren, and his background's not like some people have a wheat field or something behind their Zoom screen. He's actually where it's cold. Where are you at today? Where are you? South Dakota, right on the Minnesota border there. South Dakota and this doggone cold up there. And I just wanted to have this visit because last couple of years, or for several years actually, some really good nonprofit wildlife organizations work with major seed companies, ag industry, and they have year-old seed that's been treated with neonicotinoids. I call them neonics. It's green and orange and funky colors and big danger right on the label that I don't think anyone but geeks like me read. I mean, the first line literally on the back of the tag says danger. Don't feed the wildlife. It's on every tag with seed treated with neonicotinoids. So tell us a little bit about you, your background, and what does that mean? You know, I'm a wildlife biologist. Should I be concerned about that? How, how would that impact deer? How would that impact game birds? What's going on with that? Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I'm a scientist. I, I was trained as an entomologist. I worked on bugs for a lot of my career. I worked for the USDA for a long time near Brookings, South Dakota. And then uh, I quit in 2016 and we started something a little different, which is called Ecdysis Foundation and Blue Dasher Farm. I had to become a farmer. Um, a lot of the research that I've done over the years has been on risk assessments, assessing the risks of things like uh, pesticides and genetically modified crops and things like that against uh, things in the environment. Um, you're right, neonics are a problem. Um, I think history is, it, our, our children or children's children are gonna look back and be like, what on earth were they thinking? Um, <laughs> And, and so, uh, yeah, lots of different ways that these, that these insecticides end up affecting the, the environment. So what the heck is a neonic? That's kind of a funky name. What's a neonic? Uh, neonicotinoids are a type of insecticide. They're a neurotoxin um, that insects have to eat in order for that to work. Um, so they, uh, yep, it's one of the most widely seen insecticides used in agriculture today. And it's one of the reasons why so many of your crop seeds are different colors. Yeah, they don't grow them all pink and blue and green like that. They, they treat them with, with certain insecticides. And that color is actually a warning, right? Yeah, it lets you know that that's not a naked seed. The idea is that these, that these young plants take that insecticide up and then they're protected early season from pests but we find that there really isn't the it, yeah it's not all that effective at, at controlling those pests or the pests don't necessarily need that so i recall you actually had a you know a scientific publication about the impact of specifically neonics on deer people don't think much about deer and insecticides but can you tell me a little bit about that work and what you found right insecticides should kill insects right that's the, right in the name. That's the only thing they should affect, right? Uh, well, it, it doesn't work that way. Uh, these are, these are tend to be fairly, they, they, they're released into the natural world and they have impacts that are very, very difficult to predict a lot of times. Um, 
we were reached out a colleague of mine at South Dakota State, um, John Jenks, who's a wildlife biologist there, and I uh, were reached out to by um, uh, folks out in eastern Montana, and they had been experiencing some strangeness with their deer. Uh, the hunter killed deer had jaw deformities and, and male genitalia were malformed. And they were wondering whether or not these, whether these neonics might be a contributor. And so um, Elise Hughes-Berheim, uh, who is our master's student, uh, she decided to tackle that question in a very, very difficult study. Um, she, we had captive bred deer. Um, and we maintained those deer and their fawns in captivity, and we administered them different levels of neonics in their water. So we kind of force fed them neonicotinoids, and then we watched, and we just saw what kinds of things happen to these deer when they're exposed to this insecticide. So uh, the, the results of that were, uh, yeah, uh, jaw deformities, uh, hormonal disruptions, a greater mortality. Um, they, these deer were smaller and had smaller uh, organ weights. I'm an entomologist, right? And so I see these things in deer and I'm like, wait a minute. Uh, we're seeing the exact same things in, in, in pollinators, in bees, in butterflies, in songbirds, all in bats, all over, you know, the natural world, we're seeing these things, these same patterns. And you're just kind of like in humans, in yeah. humans. And you're kind of like, boy, what's going on here? Why aren't people yeah. connecting those dots? And that's spooky stuff. And I think it would resonate a lot because you know this, but we talk bugs. Oftentimes, some folks turn us off out there, but we're talking big old brown furry thing with big eyes. A deer can maybe get some attention, right? Now, the, the obvious question I'm going to get, well, guys, they probably loaded up 500 pounds in the water tank and it was abnormal, but your research actually took that in consideration. Yeah, so what we ended up doing is we were able to generate, so the spleens, the level of, of neonics in the spleens of the deer ended up uh -huh. being strongly correlated with a lot of these things. And so we quantified how much neonic are we seeing in these deer spleens in our study. And then North Dakota Game Fish and Parks gave us a whole bunch of hunter-killed deer spleens. Uh -huh. And we tested those two. They had three times the amount of neonics that we were able in the in the wild caught deer that we were able to generate within our experimental design three times so the effects that three times so the effects that we were seeing in in our study were probably amplified in the natural world yes ugly and, and, and I know from my work as a deer biologist, oftentimes, you know, deer die in the wild. There's not a scientist there doing a necropsy, right? I mean, it's just dead and it's scavenged on or rots or whatever. So there could be a lot sliding under radar here that's unaccounted for. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, on the flip side, you know, we're not, against, we're not anti farmers. I am a farmer for crying out sure. loud. And, and, and so <laughs> to add the insult to injury, you know, these neonicotinoids are not controlling pests very well within our agroecosystems, within these, within, you know, corn, soy, uh, we name it, uh, almost all of it's treated with neonicotinoids these days. It's not helping the farmers either. And so there isn't a whole lot of benefit unless you're selling neonic treated seeds. Exactly, exactly. So I want you to confirm the numbers I've shared in the past, but I believe the last I read from a, a valid source was about 95% of seed corn is treated with neonics and roughly 50% of soybean seeds are treated. So when you drive by an ag field of corn or soybeans and either, even other crops, there's a really good chance that insecticide was applied to those seeds. Mm -hmm. Ever spill? Ever see a spill of seeds? Like maybe when somebody's planting a big old pile out there? What's on those? Ever see anything uh, visiting that? 
a couple of my buddies actually have sent me the crop of a turkey after they harvested it. And, you know, they're looking to see what bugs are eating or whatever. And boom, there's a, I got pictures were put in here. Just open up the crop and it's full of green seed. It almost looks like a foreign seed, like, you know, some Martian put some seed out here. Well, that, that bright color is put on as a warning for humans to touch, let alone wildlife. Wildlife don't care about the color, right? They smell the corn kernel. They're going to eat it. So all through the Midwest, we drive by and you see turkeys out there almost following the drill, picking up any seed that might have not got planted deep enough. Our farmers complain about turkeys scratching in the row and digging up the seed and other birds also. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but, and the problem with neonics is that, you know, they don't stay on the seeds either. And so we're deploying these things and we're planting wildlife plantings with neonic treated seeds. Only like three to 10% of the pesticide actually goes into the crop plant. The other 97 to or 90 to 97% of that insecticide ends up getting into the water and it ends up getting into the soil and other plants that were never treated, things like, you know, wildlife plantings, uh, you know, uh, uh, diverse, you know, pollinator plantings, the uh, trees, all of these things are sucking up this neonic and you, that we're finding it in places that we never expected to. Let's switch gears a little bit to turkeys. That's a real popular game bird and pheasants and their chicks are, they're dependent on insects. That's what they eat. I mean, people think, well, you know, that little chick's out there eating a whole kernel of corn. That's not happening. It's, they're eating insects, really high protein insects. So if an insect got this insecticide in their system as it was supposed to work, what's happening there? That insect's kind of floundering around and it's a perfect target for that little pheasant, quail, turkey chick to to go snatch up. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, so that would be one pathway that these things, you know, it's what ends up happening, it's a neurotoxin, right? It's a neurotoxin in, for insects. And so um, what happens is it flips on all of the nerves and all of in the insect all at once. And so they just start like rapid fire. You'll see these insects where they're doing these twitches and that's because they can't control their own nervous system anymore. Yeah. They don't move. Uh, they, they could be eaten by something at that point. Um, the other thing is, I mean, they don't live for very long once they've hit. And sure. neonicotinoids, I mean, a lot of us hear about, do you remember the chemical DDT that yeah. used to kill off a lot of the birds of prey? When I was a kid, it was a, it was a strange thing to see a, a, an eagle or, yes, a, or, yes. a, or a hawk. Um, well, DDT was uh, to blame for that. Neonicotinoids are about five to 7,000 times more toxic for insects than DDT was. So let's take that in, folks. I mean, we all remember Rachel Carson, Rachel Carson's great book, Silent Spring, and the great work she did, which caused a landfall movement to stop the use of DDT. And you're telling me that this widely used, maybe the most common insecticide in the ag business, is that true? Yeah, uh, yep, for sure. Is, is five to 7,000 times stronger than DDT. And when we say DDT, people go, oh, you know, gosh, that was horrible. Can't believe they did that. And now we're using something five to seven times stronger and nonprofit wildlife groups are encouraging people and I think they think they're doing a good service. Hey, here's some real cheap seed, plant your wildlife food plot. I don't think they're going, oh, we're going to get some neonics out there. But, yeah. you know, they, they got a good idea, but I think they need some additional information here. Yeah, I think you're right. I think understanding, you know, I think people often think when they read the side of a jug or they or they see a, a, a bag of seed that, said, that has a label on it that somebody's watching and it's safe. Right. That, that somebody's, yeah. you know, keeping tabs on that. They've done the risk assessment. Nobody's watching. OK, yeah. I mean, I, I worked in this space for decades. Right. It's really hard to do these risk assessments against so many different creatures that they may encounter. Um, but there is an alternative and yes. it's a really good alternative with this regenerative agriculture that's starting to take off right now where. You know, we don't need all of these insecticides. I'm cheap, right? I, I, it's not idiot. It's not like some um, 
uh, some mandate that I feel like I have to, you know, avoid all pesticides, right, on my farm. I don't want to use them because I don't want to spend the money. And and what these farmers, these regenerative farmers are showing us is that really, when you've got a good system that looks at soil health and wildlife and all of the life within that farm, pesticides just aren't needed the same way as we thought. Yes, yes. I'm super pro regenerative ag and I grew up on a farm. I now work with wildlife, but if you're a wildlife person, you want to see the pollinators out there. You want to see deer out there. And having that constant cover is so much better than a disc field all winter long for so many reasons. You don't want, I don't even get started on that, but for so, so many reasons. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And while I flu pop people, we teach can do the same thing. You can have constant food out there. That's kind of our cover crop system, constant food. And I tell people, why would you want to disc it under? Because you're sending an invite to deer says, hey, you're not welcome here. Go feed at the neighbor's property. And no hunter really wants to send that message, right? Right before season, I'm going to plant my food pot. Hey, I'm going to disc it all under. It's going to be bare for three or four weeks. So you just go feed over there at Fred's place. I don't want you here. Who wants to do that? So there is a better system and a, and a less expensive system and a better for the environment system. Yep. Yep. For sure. And yeah, I think it's in the long term and the short term, this just makes a heck of a lot of sense. Yeah, I agree with you. I want to appreciate you so much for taking time, have a cold day to visit with us and share that information with us. Where can folks learn more about your grit? I've read a lot of your work, but what's the easy way for our audience to find your work and hopefully even support your work because there's a way to do that also. Sure, our science is all uh, nonprofit, and so yep, uh, you can give your money to the government or you can give it to us. Uh, we're at ecdysis bio. That's e c d y s i s dot b i o, or you can follow Blue Dasher Farm, and most of our science is uh, distributed through social media on those uh, different venues. Doctor Lundgren, I greatly appreciate your work. Uh, from a landowner and someone that's very concerned about the environment and my children and their children, my children's children someday, not yet someday. So I'm fully supportive of your work. I know it hadn't been easy for you. It's cost you a little bit professionally because you're kind of swimming upstream sometimes telling the truth out there. So I really appreciate it. Thanks for taking time today to share with us. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime. Dr. Lundgren is a wealth of knowledge, and I encourage you to check out his website to see more of his research findings. He's been doing this work for a long time, and it's someone I really rely on for that type of information. I hope each of you take some time to consider what you're putting in the ground and how important it is that we take care of creation while you're out there enjoying it. But even more important, I hope you take time daily to be quiet and seek the Creator's will for your life and apply it to your daily journey. Thanks for watching Growing Deer.